What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns. My name is Noah, and as always on these shows, I'm joined by my co-host Mike at Mike Me Up on Twitter. How are you doing today, Mike? Doing great, man. Valentine's Day weekend. Just came back in time to make sure to hop on this video and record with you and uh, get the content out to the boys. Yeah, a little West Coast time, a little Pacific Standard time got me a little messed up, but we're out here putting out content. We're talking about some young breakout receivers today, and then towards the end, we brought our new show, The Narrative, into the fold. And we're going to be talking about whether or not you should really be selling those running backs that hit, you know, 25, 26 years old. we got some big facts about that. But, you know, before we hit the intro, we like to keep it concise. But we have a giveaway winner. And, Mike, I think you have that person's name on hand. Yeah, we got it. And the person that won the free draft guide is Ryan at Ryan S897. I don't know what 897 means. It's probably some code name. But he basically bribed us with a pretty cute photo of his new kid and also talked about Superflex, and we're all about Superflex on big dogs out here. So uh, you're the winner. Like we said, man, we pick whatever the fuck we want because it's our show. So His entry enter. came in at the very last second. Right before we hopped on, he put up the picture. He was pulling out a heartstrings with a picture of a newborn baby. I mean, we kind of had to choose him. If you entered last week, enter again. You'll probably win next week. But <laughs> we'll, we'll choose whoever we want. But, you know, we like to see the feedback. It's nice. It's nice to see you guys enjoy the show. Even if you don't, give us some – you know, constructive criticism. We'll build on that. But that's enough rambling. It's time to do something, Mike. What is it? The intro. All right. I'm going to kick it off here with uh, one of my favorite wide receiver prospects. I guess he's not a prospect anymore. He's been in the NFL for a while. Tyler Boyd of the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, it seems like for whatever reason, like at the end of the season, like people just forget about what this guy did. Um, he obviously balled out last year, had his first 1K yard season as a third year. So on that traditional three-year breakout. And this year he, you know, he slowed down a little bit, but he's still pretty productive, uh, especially during the later parts of the season. I know he definitely won me a couple of DFS lineups because I stuck with him. But I just want to remind people that of how good of a prospect Tyler Boyd was coming in, okay? He had an 18-year-old breakout age, which is 90-plus plus percentile, 40%-plus dominator, again, elite profile. Um, and those two things combined together is very hard to have. You know, a lot of times you'll get a lot of guys that break out in 18, but then they kind of fall off. Uh, or they have really high dominators, but they weren't able to do it enough at an early age. And so to get both of those together, that's kind of when you get that elite prospect that really hits that top end ceiling that you want to see. And if you look at his chart and of his age adjusted production, it's also just pretty incredible. He's always above the uh, mean regression line. So elite prospect into the NFL, prove that he can do it twice. And now if we look at his situation going into next year, what does he get? He gets Joe Burrow. Most likely. I'm just guessing here, but if the Bengals don't choose Joe Burrow, I think the city's going to burn. Yeah, that's like the only selection that's basically locked in at this point. And I think that's why a lot of people are buying into Tyler Boyd because they know what the quarterback situation is going to be next year. Whereas like in Miami, we're not sure if they go for Tua, what's going to happen in LA. At least there's like a 95% chance that if there's somebody competent in the front office there that they're going to go with Joe Burrow. Yeah, exactly. And we know, well, we don't know, but we're suspecting that AJ Green probably won't be there. I mean, the guy basically rode the bench for the entire year. So in terms of the future, I think Boyd is it. He's only 25 years old, still yet to hit that peak prime, prime age for wide receivers, but just entering it. So this is, I think this is kind of the lowest point, or I guess the last low point that you can buy him in at a reasonable price. And I would totally be happy with having Tyler Boyd as like my wide receiver 2-3 on, on my teams. And in terms of what I would give for him, if we look at like what – the price is right now. I think he's probably in that late first range. I'd be willing to pay anywhere up to the 1.08. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because I probably prefer Boyd to most of the wide receiver prospects coming into this class outside of maybe Lamb and Rager and potentially Judy. Although uh -oh. that's kind of Rager's washed. climbing up those boards. I like yeah, to hear for that. sure. So I would start by giving it late first and see if that gets it done. If it doesn't, maybe add a little bit on top. And if you have to move up, move up. But Another potential option would be to do like a trade down. You know, I'm pretty sure that you could probably get Boyd for Julio straight up, especially if it's a contender. And if that's a trade that can get done, that's a trade I'm definitely willing to do. 
Other options would be, you know, Amari or Galladay trading down to Boyd and getting a pick back, uh, like a late first, early second, things like that. So I'd say those are the options that I go for when it comes to Boyd. Yeah, I love all of those. Just because you look at what Tyler Boyd has done these past two seasons, two years ago, right, he missed a few games. We put up over 1,000 yards and half, not half the season, but a lot of that season was played with Jeff Driscoll, who was like a college sprinter who couldn't throw the football. And I think it was over the first eight or nine weeks when A.J. Green was healthy. He was the wide receiver 12, and I think A.J. Green was like the wide receiver 7. Both were eating. So even if A.J. Green does get franchise tagged or whatever and he's brought back this season, uh, obviously in the future he's not going to be around too much longer because he's been banged up and he's a bit older. But even if he's around next year with Joe Burrow, uh, you hope he spreads the ball around a lot. And they've shown that when they're on the field together, they're going to produce. Even this year, he spent half the season with Dalton, a couple games with Ryan Finley. Then they went back to Dalton. So it was just back and forth between mediocre and terrible quarterbacks. He still went over 1,000 yards. He's shown he could be a wide receiver one on an offense, albeit not a fantastic one, but somebody that can produce for you for fantasy. And, you know, he's been a top, I think he was 18, wide receiver 18 these past two seasons, despite not scoring a whole lot of touchdowns this past year. And the year prior, obviously sharing the field a lot of the time with A.J. Green, he did score more touchdowns. Uh, in 2018 but he was still very productive despite facing a lot stiffer target competition so yeah I I completely agree the only thing as I said before is like a lot of people know that Joe Burrow is going to be there so I think it's going to be really hyped up that Tyler Boyd is going to be like a fringe wide receiver one this year if you're finding that the price is a little bit too high on him I'd maybe just wait till the beginning of the season or maybe the preseason and try to capitalize because I remember last year I think it was week two or week three of the preseason Kyler Murray just did not look good and people seem to be all out on him. And I capitalized on a trade back then where I gave up Baker Mayfield. I got a second round pick, two thirds and a fourth plus Kyler Murray in a super flex league because people like suddenly forget how good a prospect or how good a player is because they're playing against backups and the team doesn't want to show their offensive scheme. And it's literally the first or second time they're going up against NFL competition. So if you see yeah. Joe Burrow, maybe struggle a little bit in the preseason or early on, just try to capitalize on all those weapons because he is a good quarterback. The offensive line is building. And for as bad as, you know, Cincinnati has been for as long as I can remember, they always produce fantasy assets, whether it be Jeremy Hill, Giovanni Bernard, A.J. Green, Brandon LaFell here and there, Tyler Eifert, who I don't even know how that guy isn't on the IR every single day. So it always seems like both or Cincinnati, the Bengals always have fantasy viable options. I think Tyler Boyd is going to be that because he's shown it in terrible situations. It's only looking up from here. Yeah, he, he kind of reminds me of a uh... – He's like a younger Bobby Woods, you know, because he plays that flanker role. Like he's never going to be that true wide receiver one because but he's, he's just consistent be, week after week. He's just consistent. Yeah. You know, you need to be like, everyone thinks that you can just build an entire dynasty roster with like top 12 wide receivers, like newsflash. There's only 12 of them and you have yeah. 12 people in your league. So the math there is not going to work out. You need to <laughs> actually have like just really rubbing it yeah. in that he can count. You need to time. actually have like these wide receiver twos. And I think he could be like that long-term wide receiver two going forward. Yeah, and the fact that he did it at such a young age. I mean, even his rookie year, you look back, it wasn't all that bad considering he was a rookie and he was competing with A.J. Green. So, you know, that second year was a big dip, but that third-year breakout happened and he sustained it throughout this past year. So he's somebody I'm buying in on. Another guy I'm buying in on, I know you love him too, Christian Kirk, wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals. A lot of people are down on him, I would say, just because you look at his first two seasons and objectively, just looking at the numbers, statistics alone, you're like, yeah, this guy, he ain't it. But you look at the situation he was thrown into as a rookie. His quarterbacks Awful. were Sammy Sleeves and Josh Rosen, and his Awful. offensive coordinator was Mike McCoy. And we trashed Mike McCoy for running David Johnson up the middle every play. Maybe he knew it was up because that's basically all he can do nowadays. Well, he doesn't even run up the middle. He kind of jogs up the middle and gets, like, hit stick by the nearest linebacker. But He looks scared to get hit right these days, I think. It's actually really sad to see. There was that one clip where, like, he tried to bounce it outside, but he was, like, what? jogging, and he just got lit up. It was... <laughs> It wasn't a good look for David Johnson. I'm sorry if you're listening to this. I hope you're listening to this because that means we got a pretty good reach. But um, <laughs> come on, man. Just let Kenyon Drake take the job. But going <laughs> back to Christian Kirk. So as a rookie, the situation, as we all know, was kind of garbage. But he still had a fairly decent rookie season, all things considered, competing with Larry Fitzgerald, who was the alpha there. And this past season, again, he had a rookie quarterback who was very good, but that offense started off slow. He was with a first-time head coach in Cliff Kingsbury there. They were extremely conservative, and I'll get into the numbers a little bit later. And obviously, he was still competing with Larry Fitzgerald. He didn't have as much juice as he's had in the past, but you know, he was a decent enough wide receiver, you know, three for fantasy wide receiver two in real life. And his season was split in half by an ankle injury that I think it either came right after that three touchdown game. So like people were really hyped up about him. He got hurt, 
the rest of the season kind of went downhill. Kyler Murray down the end of the season uh, had a hamstring injury. He missed a game and he was out for like half the game. But you look at the way that this offense is progressing and it's only looking up for them, which is why I'm buying in on Christian Kirk because, you know, despite them not being a high powered offense right away, they were fourth in pace. So they weren't dominating time of possession. But when they did have the ball, they were running a ton of plays. Pace is just plays ran per second. So when they have the ball on offense, they're getting a lot of volume because they're actually, you know, trying to capitalize on the time that they do have the ball because it's not very often with the defense that they throw out on the field. On top of that, the games where Christian Kirk and Kyler Murray were on the field at the same time, uh, taking out the one where he left early with that hamstring injury, he, uh, Kyler Murray attempted 36.2 passes per game. So if you're saying that them drafting a wide receiver in the first or second round is going to really hurt his volume, you have to consider that this is a team that wants to throw the ball. It's that air raid system. If they bring in a C.D. Lamb or a Jerry Judy, let's say they even come in and get 100 targets, which is, you know, it may sound conservative, but what did D.K. Metcalf lead receivers with this year as a rookie, like 90-something, 100? Mm-hmm. So it's, not, it's not too unreasonable to think that. There's still enough targets to go around for Christian Kirk to dominate. On top of that, Christian Kirk hasn't really been a great touchdown scorer throughout his career so far. He only has six touchdowns, but again, I'm probably going to just throw out that rookie season because nobody was scoring touchdowns on that offense. And then this past year, they were historically terrible in the red zone. You look at the percentage of touchdowns scored inside the 20, they ranked 29th in the league despite being the team that ranked 14th in red zone trips per game. So they were getting into the red zone. They weren't converting. They were extremely conservative. They took eight field goals. Nobody. Nobody loves kicking field goals in the red zone like early season Cliff Kingsbury, man. Dude, he took eight field goals, or he made eight field goals from inside the five-yard line. Yeah. Who's doing – why would you ever – you have a rookie quarterback. Obviously, you don't want to, like, throw him into the wolves, but you get down to the three, and you're like, hey, Zane Gonzalez, let's, let's chip this in. I don't, want, I don't want to win this game. Like, that doesn't instill a lot of confidence, but I think that's something that down the stretch they showed a little bit more confidence in Kyler Murray with his legs around the end zone, but also just throwing the ball a bit more. And I think, you know, as Kyler gets a little more comfortable, as Cliff gets a little more comfortable, good things are to come for Christian Kirk. And if you look at his pace for this season, he was actually used very heavily. He was on pace for 133 targets. 84 receptions, 873 yards, four touchdowns. And I ran something on Rotoviz, a little screener, since the year 2000 for wide receivers that have hit 80 receptions, 800 yards, 120 targets before the age 23 season. It gave me 21 results. And a lot of them are very good. I'll run through them quickly because you don't want to hear me drone on about it. They were Michael Clayton, Allen Robinson, Amari Cooper, Sidney Rice, Brandon Cooks, Jordan Matthews, Percy Harvin, Josh Gordon, DJ Moore, Alshon Jeffrey, Odell, Eddie Royal, I don't know why he is in there. Michael Thomas, Can't Mike see. Evans, Dave Boston, Anquan Bolden, Brandon Marshall, Juju, Larry Fitzgerald, D-Hop, Jarvis. There's a lot of names. Basically, every single one was an elite fantasy asset, unless it was for injury or unless their initials were E and R. So he's on a very good path to success, especially considering the offense that he's in. And as Mike brought up with Tyler Boyd, you look at this guy's profile heading into the NFL. Christian Kirk has one of the best college profiles I've ever seen he broke out at like 18 years old it was a 95th percentile breakout as a true freshman in the SEC he put up over 1700 total yards and nine touchdowns which is incredible he was using the return game he's used heavily as a receiver he's an extremely versatile player he hasn't been able to really show that and you know all three years at A&M he was like absolutely dominant and elite he's dynamic he's a dynamic player like he he hasn't been able to show that in the offense that he's been put into recently so even if they get another like another number one on this team Christian Kirk currently going as the wide receiver 25 off the board not to say that's his floor but for a guy that's not even 24 years old yet that has shown as much as he has and with the profile that he has in an up-and-coming offense I'm completely buying in on him yeah you want to buy in on the guys with the good profiles uh the especially ones that show improvement which Kirk did you know he's more involved in the offense he put up more production and you know again he's another one of those guys where it's like People are out on him because they don't see him as a true wide receiver one. I don't care. Like yeah, he's fantasy, gonna you don't be, have to be like a true alpha dog receiver yeah. one to be a wide receiver one in fantasy. Yeah, I mean, look at guys like Juju. You know, that's like the type of mold that you kind of want to see. And Kirk, I believe he takes about one third of his snaps out of the slot, and that's kind of where he's better. I think. You know, he's not as good outside. Obviously, he's, he's a lot smaller in stature, and aside from his speed, he's not really gonna beat you with his athleticism. But if they use him in that, like, flanker-type role, I actually see him, like, very close to Tyler Boyd. I have them back-to-back in my, in my rankings. So, like you said, man, it's going to be 
a good offense. You're buying in on the offense, you're buying in on Kyler Murray, and you're buying in on Christian Kirk. Yeah, especially with these young breakout guys, you want to look at opportunity and situation, and that's huge for him because, you know, obviously he hasn't been great up until this point, but everything is pointing in the right direction for him. And as for trade options that we want to bring up, I actually had Tyler Boyd or Christian Kirk up here. Those two are extremely close for me as well. I think I lean Kirk a little bit just because of the youth factor. I think, you know, at least we know Kyler Murray is good. We know the offense that they're going to be running. That kind of sways me. What do you feel about on that one, Mike? Uh, I, I have Kirk literally uh, one rank ahead of Tyler Boyd. Yeah, I think they're I have back to back. 20. Like, I would not give one for the other, basically, you know. I would just, if yeah, I have Boyd, I'll hold Boyd. To move it there, yeah. yeah. What about Christian Kirk and if you were to get a mid to late one for an A.J. Brown? I would take that in a heartbeat. That's how I feel because at least, you know, Kirk, you know, he's going to get volume. A.J. Brown, we know, is extremely efficient from what we saw this year. But if you're getting that much capital and a receiver that we believe is going to break out, give me that. Yeah, you can I get would, like a running back with that. You know, you could be talking like yeah, Cam Akers talking about, Christian Kirk. Yeah, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire and Christian Kirk for A.J. Brown. I would take that in a heartbeat. What about D.K. Metcalf and Christian Kirk for like a second-round pick or, and a second-round pick on top? I got Kirk above DK, so if I'm getting anything on top of Kirk, I will take Kirk. Yeah, I actually have Christian Kirk ahead, too. I just added more to the Kirk side because I think consensus is that DK Metcalf is a better fantasy asset than Kirk. No, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, you can, get, you can definitely get a second easily, I think. Yeah, because I think, you know, DK Metcalf is that big pumped-up wide receiver. Everybody wants to buy in on him. Quietly, Christian Kirk is very good and almost as young as DK Metcalf. So, yeah, he's he's somebody that I'm buying in on. You can probably get a lot of these offers. They're not too unreasonable especially with the hype around guys like a DK Metcalf and an AJ Brown to capitalize on somebody that could have that third year leap that we've seen so many times. Exactly. So the next guy will not surprise anyone. I've been standing for him since, you know, forever, but it's Nikhil Harry. And again, I just, I just go back to what his profile is as a prospect. You know, he had an awful start to his career, right? He got injured, was not productive. The entire Patriots offense was trash. Um, I'm not going to make excuses for Harry. Like he didn't, he didn't perform either. Right. He didn't step up. In he an dropped a lot of passes, but people forget yeah. who he is. Yeah, exactly. But let's look at his profile, right? He's again, 18 year old breakout. You're talking about 95th percentile, 40% plus dominator. On top of that, he's a 90th percentile spark athlete. He's a freak. Uh, and he's a 90th percentile speed. And from that perspective, he's just, he's just a whole package, right? He really checks off every box you want. And I know that, the natural progression is to go to first year bust and say, well, you know, most wide receivers that bust in the first year don't go on to succeed. But the problem is like most prospects don't have the same traits and the same profile that Harry does. And there's very few that do. And if you think of like a comp in terms of his situation would be someone like Demarius Thomas, right? Demarius Thomas was someone who absolutely fell on his face when he came to the NFL he was not polished at all as a wide receiver. You know, very similar to Harry. He's not polished as a route runner. He has a lot to learn, especially trying to learn the Patriots offensive system. So he has hurdles to overcome there. But you give him the time to develop, and in terms of his dominator and breakout, like they're way more similar from that perspective. And even from an athleticism perspective, granted, Harry's not the freak that DT was, but I think he's still definitely up there. And I had this comp for Harry like a while ago, and it's Anquan Bolden. And I think, like, that's who I see when I watch Harry play. He's great at uh, yards after the catch. Like, once he gets the ball in his hands, if you manufacture touches for Harry, kind of like how you manufacture touches for Debo Samuel, I think they can be very similar in terms of the production, except, you know, obviously Harry has a much more elite profile. So I'm still buying on him. I see a lot of owners bailing on him now. Uh, I've seen him go for seconds, which is ridiculous. I'll cop the buy on that all day. I'd be willing to pay up to late 2021st because – Basically, if you look at the incoming class, you know, there's a lot of good players, but none of them have the same profile. So if I'm going to bet on a profile, I'm probably going to bet on Harry over like some of the guys like, you know, Justin Jefferson, uh, some of those guys going to the later range of the first first rounds, like LaVisca Chanel and stuff like that. He's basically just a better LaVisca Chanel and yeah. somebody who we know is athletic and had the draft cap, whereas LaVisca Chanel, all those things are up in the air. And you hit the nail on the head for Nikhil Harry, right? He didn't look great this year, but you have to realize he was injured for most of the offseason. I know people think that's like a death sentence on a receiver, but we just saw Mike Williams have two pretty good seasons back to back after spending his whole first year in the NFL nursing like a broken back. Um, obviously, Mike Williams isn't one of the best receivers in the league, and that's not a great career path to go down. But Nikhil Harry being picked in the first round with the profile that he has and the skill set that he has, I think a big issue looking at what he was like used as this year 
was he was using contested situations a lot, like downfield. He's a guy that you want to get the ball in his hands because during his time at ASU, he was just incredible after the catch. I'm not so sure that the Patriots, maybe he was still lingering on that injury and they didn't want to use him in the open field and try to create space because that wasn't in his repertoire at that point in the season. But I think as the team starts to use him more in that you know open field and screens and manufactured touches for him, like you said with Debo Samuel, uh, only good things are going to come of it. He's still extremely young. We saw a guy like Devontae Parker, who was picked 50 years ago, break out this year because he had that awesome profile that Nikhil Harry has. And I'm not saying that it's going to take that long for Harry to break out, although it might. Like he, he has the opportunity to produce because the draft capital is there, because the profile is there. And there's obviously not much to go off of this season. But from what you have prior to this season, being the consensus 101 in rookie drafts and him just falling you know, to being valued as a second-round pick because he was injured, I just think that's, I don't know, I think that's foolish. Yeah, also I see, like, some stuff on Twitter. I forgot who it was. Someone tweeted, said that some NFL people thought that Brandon Ayuk was a better prospect than Nikhil Harry. Yeah, the guy that was better than him at college is actually worse than him. Shut your damn mouth, okay? If there's actually people in the world that believe this, and I think there are because based on what I see on Twitter, if Brandon Ayuk goes in the first round of NFL drafts, I think people will take him in the first of your rookie drafts. So in that back half of the first, before you click the button to draft Brandon Ayuk, slap yourself in the face first to realize that you're an idiot and make a trade for Nikhil Harry. That's my, that's the best advice I can give to you. When you're sitting there on the clock and someone wants one of these overhyped rookie prospects, buy Nikhil Harry instead. Yeah, it's, I completely agree. He's somebody I'm buying in on. Another guy I am super high on right now is Curtis Samuel, wide receiver of the Carolina Panthers. Now, This past season, you probably couldn't have told that he was a wide receiver because he was not catching any passes. And that was to, like, no fault of his own. He was trying to catch passes from Kyle Allen, who quite possibly may be one of the worst quarterbacks these two eyes have ever seen. And I saw Phillip Rivers play this year, so I've I've, I've got a lot of digging uh, under my belt. Kyle Allen was a disgrace. I'll get into his numbers a little bit later, but just talking about what Curtis Samuel did this year, right? Mike, where do you think he ranked on the season in air yards among all receivers? Top five. Ninth. He had the ninth most air yards this year at 1,608. Every other receiver that had over 1,420 air yards had 1,000 receiving yards. Only he and Robbie Anderson were receivers with over 1,300 air yards with less than 1,000 receiving yards. So usually air yards is very predictive of fantasy success because either you're getting a lot of deep throws and you're converting on, you know, some of them unless you play for the Panthers or you're just getting a whole bunch of volume in chunks and that adds up to a ton of air yards. That didn't really happen with Kyle Allen under center. Uh, Curtis Samuel only had 501 completed air yards on the season. So less than a third of the air yards intended for him were actually landing in the hands of Curtis Samuel. And that is in large part due to Kyle Allen not being able to throw a football. He attempted 54 deep passes this year. 16 were deemed catchable. So if you do a little math, That means 70% of the time Kyle Allen dropped back to throw a 20 yard pass. There was no shot a receiver could catch it. That like, that was wild. I saw like a 30% deep accuracy. I'm like, that's not too bad. But then I flipped down like 70% of the time his receiver couldn't even catch it. That's, I don't know how you're an NFL quarterback. Yeah. I don't know how you're an NFL quarterback with that, but you look at how Curtis Samuel was used not only this year, but in the years prior, he's actually been heavily involved in the red zone. He actually led the team in red zone targets this year with 14 Last season, he came in third. I think he only had nine, but he was behind uh, Christian McCaffrey and Devin Funches, who Devin Funches isn't there anymore. And as far as deep targets go, he saw 27 on the season, which ranked 10th. And if you look at the catchable deep targets of every other receiver that ranked in the top 20, their average catchable deep targets was 13.1. Curtis Samuel had five catchable deep targets on the season on 27. So less than a fifth of his deep targets were actually able to be hauled in. What I take away from this, obviously, it's a bunch of numbers. It's some, you know, analysis here and there, is that Curtis Samuel is an integral part of this offense. The production doesn't say so. Obviously, it was heavily run through DJ Moore and Christian McCaffrey. But the fact that Curtis Samuel could cement himself as a legitimate red zone weapon, somebody who scored 14 touchdowns these past few seasons, 11 of them them coming in the red zone, six inside the 10, and being used in the deep game, just shows me that for fantasy purposes, he's going to have a role that brings a lot of value, right? A lot of touchdowns, a lot of chunk yards on deep plays. All they need is a quarterback. Obviously, that is up in the air. But from what we just heard about Kyle Allen, it can only go up from what was there. Even if Cam Newton without any elbow, without any 
shoulder without any rotator cuff, I believe would be better than what Kyle Allen is. And on top of that, and you may know a little bit more about his system than I do, but Joe Brady from uh, LSU is coming in there. And they also have Matt Rule from Baylor. So this offense is going to be completely revamped. They're getting new guys, you know, calling plays, which is going to be a lot better than North Turner. North Turner's son, who I don't even know if Watford, like, he knows what football is. So they're going to have, like, actual, you know, play callers there. Probably going to get Curtis Samuel out in space a bit more because he's a guy in college who played wide receiver and running back. He's an electric player in space, yet he only averages, like, one point, I think it was, like, 1.6 yards after catch in the NFL just because he's used – mostly as a deep threat and isn't manufactured touches. I hope they get him out in space a little bit more next season because that could just only add on to his fantasy yeah. value. Look, you can't get yards after the catch if you don't have a quarterback that allows you to. I think that's a concept that people don't really grasp. Like A lot of these great yards after the catch guys, like Kittle, not taking anything away from him, but he benefits from, one, having Kyle Shanahan scheme him into open space, right, which Norv Turner didn't do. And two, he has a quarterback, although people, you know, shit on Jimmy Garoppolo all the time, he's still a starting caliber quarterback, and he has to throw you the ball on time in stride for you to get yards of the catch. Yeah. Kyle Allen is not hitting you in stride. He's not hitting so. you at all. <laughs> he's hitting yeah. the ground half the time. Yeah. But uh, the good point about the Joe Brady and Matt Rule, I think, um, let's, who was it that mentioned this? I think it was Ray. Ray mentioned this, tweeted it, and I thought it made a ton of sense. But if the Panthers move up, and snag Tua. How interesting would that be, right? Like that'd be beautiful. You know, Joe Brady did not leave LSU to coach Kyle Allen. Let's just let's just put that out there. Okay. Matt Rule did not leave college to coach Kyle Allen. So they're going to need to address that position, whether it's through Cam Newton, if they believe he's healthy, or through drafting someone and developing them. Kyle Allen's not the long term answer. So I think what you're seeing at, in Carolina is a floor situation for most of the players there, other than CMC, because he's a fucking god. Okay, But for everyone else, the wide receivers, I think there's, there's much room to improve. Yeah, and you look at where he's been picked in Dynasty Leagues right now. He's the wide receiver 39 off the board. But this past season, he finishes the wide receiver 36. Obviously, per, like point per game basis was a bit lower because he did play the entire season. A lot of guys that played partial seasons were better in those limited games. But the fact that he finished above where he's going right now, despite that situation and, and being like third fiddle to two really elite guys, obviously he's still going to be third in line for touches there. But as his offense gets a little bit more efficient, uh, as you know they start to throw to Curtis Samuel a little bit more, I mean, he did have a lot of targets this year, but as those targets get a little bit more accurate, no matter who is under center, if they bring in Derek Carr, like that guy at least completes like 65% of his passes. Kyle Allen was not the answer. He still is not the answer. They, as you said, it's a great point. These two guys did not come from, you know, great jobs in college to the NFL to coach a, like a guy who was worse than the quarterbacks that they had in college. So, yeah, he's he's somebody I'm trying to move, you know, pieces for. A mid-second round pick for him, I would take Curtis Samuel or Will Fuller. I think you could probably flip that and I would take Curtis Samuel because he's actually on the field every other game. And how do you feel about this trade, Mike? Curtis Samuel and let's say the one the 110 for Terry McLaurin. I would take the Curtis Samuel side and never look back. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be hesitant to do that. But I agree because Curtis Samuel is basically the same age as Terry McLaurin in what looks to be a better situation. Obviously, the quarterback isn't figured out there. But I'd be surprised if Washington heads into the year with Terry McLaurin as even if he is the one on that team, I would be surprised if he's anything more than a 1A to somebody else's 1B. Yeah, dude, I love Curtis Samuel. I mean, if you look at his profile, he's not the traditional wide receiver because, like you said, he was using the backfield a lot. He was just a great playmaker. But he's also an elite athlete, right? This guy runs a 4'3", uh, 92nd percentile speed score, 88th percentile spark athlete. And despite his stature, last year he was actually really good in contested catch situations. And if you watch him, again, I'm not a film expert. I just watch sometimes for fun. But he has a pretty pretty nasty release off the line of scrimmage, right? And he can actually handle – press release pretty well the problem is obviously when he beats people nobody's hitting him with the ball like either cam is overthrown him by 10 yards or it's Kyle like Allen's. that gif of like will, uh, will smith just standing in his living room with like nothing around he's trying yeah. to hit the ball it's just like, nothing there every single replay i saw earlier on the season I'm like dude he's open what happened like cam just like <laughs> couldn't hit him and kyle allen's obviously thrown in the stand so i think i think if he gets a quarterback he's going to convert those yards because he is getting open based on what i've seen he's getting open he's good at contested catch he is elite speed, elite athlete that you can't teach. Like, here's, here's the thing. People are trying to chase Henry Ruggs, okay, because they think oh, he's a no. speed demon. Bush, I will take turn the video off. Curtis Samuel 
over Henry Ruggs all day because Curtis Samuel has at least shown what he can do in the NFL, and he showed what he could do in college. And he, although might not be as fast as Henry Ruggs, he's plenty fast enough, and he's a way more dynamic playmaker. So if you're going to – and I think Henry Ruggs is going to go in, like, you know, the mid-first, like maybe even later on in the first. So if you can get Curtis Samuel for a mid-second, or if you're sitting on the clock – at 1.06, and you have a Henry Ruggs truther in your league. I know. Sell one. that pick for Curtis Samuel plus a second, and that's a win. Yeah, we'll get into it later in a different video about like how to trade different strategies. But when you're on the clock, those picks are extremely valuable, especially when a guy like Henry Ruggs, where there's probably two or three people in your league, are really high on them. Uh, trading that pick for a player at that point is going to net you so much more value than if you're trading at this point. So just a little nugget to take away. If you're trading any type of first-round pick right now, you're probably going to get more value in the coming months after the NFL draft when we know these landing spots. Because obviously, let's say C.D. Lamb goes to a terrible situation. I don't really, off the top of my head, whatever. If he goes to the Jets. Titans. Right? Yeah, Jets or Titans. He's Obviously, it's not as good as what we're projecting him right now, but he's still going to be a first-round pick. Whereas, as you said, Brandon Ayuk, he goes in the first round later. That might push other guys down the board. So those picks that are now later or even second round picks are going to gain value because the players you thought you were going to have to take in the first round are now being pushed into the second round. So if you're trying to trade picks, hold on right now. Try to make a move for Curtis Samuel when you're on the clock. Obviously, if Carolina picks up a quarterback through the draft, his value might you know, increase a little bit. But in the back of people's minds, there's still going to be DJ Moore and Christian McCaffrey there. So they're not going to see him as anything more than a wide receiver, you know, three or four for fantasy and the wide receiver two on his own team. But I'm not scared of Ian Thomas. We saw Curtis Samuel be a very, you know, decent fantasy option this season. He's shown he can get into the end zone if anything improves from situation-wise. Like, he was a guy everybody was pegging to break out this year because I think it was Matt Harmon. Yeah, he put up his reception perception. I was super high on him too. I didn't think he would finish too far behind DJ Moore, and I was obviously wrong about that. But everything, you know, I, I don't think he should be evaluated much differently going into this year uh, than he was last year. So that obviously opens up the opportunity for you to buy him low right now. Yeah, look, he's a better Tyreek Hill than Henry Ruggs. I said it. Put my stamp of approval on that shit. Hate me, I don't care. Those <laughs> are the facts. Next up, Deontay Johnson. Uh, this is someone that I actually really liked coming in the season. He doesn't have that typical analytical profile, but... The thing is, Steelers actually just, they're just good at drafting wide receivers, right? There's certain teams that I look to, and obviously they have scouts that know much more than I do and much more than Noah does or any of you Twitter, watch it. any of you Twitter uh, self, self-proclaimed self gods think you know. So whenever the Steelers draft someone, I do tend to pay attention. And shockingly, I know I, I went and looked at some film for DJ because the analytics weren't there to see what, what people liked about him. And... I think he's someone, tell me if you disagree, but he's pretty good off press, right? When I watch him. I don't really know. I think he's a really scrimmage. good route runner. I think he's like just a really good number two receiver. Yeah, yeah. He's also really good at routes. And he lined up this year 89% from the X slot. So they're using him in that AB role uh, to kind of complement Juju Smith-Schuster. And I think he's better than Washington. Uh, I've said that he's better than Washington for a while now because he complements Juju much better, right? Washington actually took like 30% of his snaps from in the slot. And part of that is because Juju Smith-Schuster went down. So he got a lot of opportunity there. But I think when all of them are healthy in two wide receiver sets, you're going to see more of Deontay Johnson plus Juju Smith-Schuster than you will of James Washington. So just on opportunity alone, I think he's a potential good buy. His price right now is he's going as the wide receiver 44. So, you know, basically a back-end wide receiver four. And I think that's too low, right? You know, we've kind of covered it a little bit. His situation was also awful, right? Like, who was as bad as Kyle Allen was this year? Mason Rudolph. Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph. Yeah. Like, the Carolina Panthers and Steelers put out some of the worst quarterback play I've seen in my time of watching the NFL. So, if Big Ben comes back, obviously it's a question mark. We don't know how good his elbow is. But if Big Ben comes back, I think there can be enough room in the offense to eat for both DJ and Juju Smith-Schuster. I think Washington will be left out. But even this year, with Duck and with Mason Rudolph, from weeks 14 to 17, the most critical time of our fantasy football time together, what would be your guess for his positional finish? I see the number, but I'll just say, if I, if I weren't to know, I would have said like wide receiver 32. Yeah. So he finishes the wide receiver 12. So he was a wide receiver one during that period of time. 
when he was given the opportunity after coming back from injury and getting more into the offense. So I think he's going to be someone that I own a lot of in terms of offers. I think he's pretty cheap, man. You could probably get him for, you know, a couple thirds, maybe an early third plus a mid third. Uh, I would be willing to pay a low second at the top end because, again, I'm going to prefer someone like DJ to some of these hyped-up senior bowl prospects that people keep talking about, like uh, Antonio Gandy, whatever his name is, Antonio Gandy-Golden. Um, and I think for in terms of constructing a trade, though, he's probably easier acquired if you do like a package deal. So you do a big piece trade down and you like, hey, I want him as a toss-in. And I do this all the time where – I'm willing to trade like laterally with players I think I have in the same tier to target like a lesser player that people don't care about. And I'll talk about one later on. But I think that's probably your best acquisition strategy. What would yeah, you pay De- for him? Deontay Johnson, I'm a fan of his. I actually going into the season, I didn't know much about him. Actually, not going into the season, but going into the rookie draft season, I didn't know too much about him. I believe he went to Toledo and he didn't have like a great final season. But the year prior, he had like an incredible season. I started looking to his tape a little bit more and he just looked like an NFL ready receiver. And that's what he was. I mean, James Washington had a few good weeks here and there, but Deontay Johnson just kind of blew past him in terms of fantasy relevance and in terms of like real life importance for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I just think he's a great receiver. I think it might be a little bit low, like multiple thirds, because in a startup I recently did, I think he went in the 10th round. Oh, wow. That's a little high. Yeah, it's pretty high. I think a lot of people from what they saw this past year, whether it be like Cortland Sutton or Michael Gallup or DJ Chark, those guys breaking out in year two, I think lends a lot of people to believe that Deontay Johnson is going to go down that very similar path. But I see a very similar situation to Michael Gallup, somebody who showed a lot of flashes as a rookie. You know, obviously the Cowboys bring in, or they had uh, Mari Cooper down the second half. And then as he established himself as the one, Michael Gallup was obviously afforded easier coverage on the outside or wherever he was lining up. I think the same is going to be the case for Juju as the, or for Deontay Johnson as Juju gets healthy for next year. As he get better quarterback play, he could be a very good complimentary receiver in the NFL. I think he could return wide receiver three value as early as next season. So he's somebody I'm buying in on. Honestly, if you have to overpay in terms of, you know, what his value is right now, I think I would go out and do it because I have a lot of faith in him being a very valuable fantasy asset going forward. Just because, as you said, Pittsburgh seems to always have that really good uh, scouting department when it comes to wide receivers. He could be the next Emmanuel Sanders to the Antonio Brown, or he could be the next Juju to the Antonio Brown. I think you know, there's a lot of opportunity there for him to capitalize upon. And he showed enough as a true rookie that I have confidence in him going forward. So what would you pay like a mid second? I'd pay a mid second for him right now. But I think, I don't know. I think mid second is definitely fair value. You might be able to get him for that late second. I think those third round picks people really devalue, but in super flex leagues, a lot of guys fall. As you said, when you're on the clock though, you could probably flip two thirds for him when you're on the clock, which I would do. So at this point right now, two-thirds may not get it done. A little bit in the future, you could definitely go out and do it. And as you said, as a trade chip, just as an add-on to a deal, people yeah. aren't going to you know, throw a deal away because Deontay Johnson is added on one side. Exactly. And people will lose because of that very concept. Yeah. It's like on eBay when you're bidding and somebody bids 95 and you want 100. It's like, are you going to throw this deal away over $5? It's like, I probably will because I'm cheap, but a lot of people are thinking, <laughs> you know, give me the other side. So yeah, he's somebody I'm high on. Another guy I'm high on was actually undrafted as uh, an NFL prospect. His name is Preston Williams, the wide receiver out of Miami from, I believe, Colorado State, Michael Gallup's alma mater as well. All I have to say about him is he is good at football. Over the first, I think it was eight weeks before he got injured, he was playing again like Christian Kirk with Josh Rosen in three games. Josh Rosen started in another one. He attempted 18 passes. Yet his pace for the entire season was 120 targets, 64 receptions, 856 yards, six touchdowns. And another interesting thing I found is in those eight games, five of them came against top seven coverage rated defenses. He played Baltimore, New England, Dallas, Buffalo, and Pittsburgh over that span. So he was doing really well with terrible quarterback play and, you know, terrible matchups in just a bad situation. And even in the games when Ryan Fitzpatrick was playing, Fitzpatrick didn't really heat up till the second half of the year. And that's when Devontae Parker really started to come on as that wide receiver one for fantasy purposes. It was after Preston Williams went down. And it's because Preston Williams, was really dominating that entire offense. He led the team in red zone targets with 10, which was four more than Devontae Parker over that span. And you look at his pace when Ryan Fitzpatrick was even under center, right? Ryan Fitzpatrick, as the quarterback in four games uh, with Preston Williams, Preston was on pace for 116 targets, 72 receptions, 880 yards, and 12 touchdowns uh, in comparison to Devontae Parker, who was 124 targets, 72 receptions, 984 yards, four touchdowns. It was basically more of a 1A, 1B than a 1 and a 2 in the wide receiver room there. 
Now, Preston, so Williams, sure. uh, Preston Williams died so that Devontae Parker could thrive. Yeah, and I'm not so sure that he's not going to rise from the ashes like a phoenix and absolutely destroy Devontae Parker next year because <laughs> when they were on the field together, I mean, it, it wasn't as clear, cut, and dry, like, as I said before, one and two, because they were both dominating in their own respect. And despite the offense not looking great, they were still producing. And I have another one of those Rotovis screeners that I threw out there. Um, if you put out the filter as wide receivers age 22 or younger to hit 90 targets, 50 receptions, 650 yards, and five touchdowns, which he didn't hit, but he was well on pace to surpass all those numbers, targets by over 30, receptions by 14, receiving yards by 20 or 200. So he was well on his pace to do that. The following season, the average receiving line of those receivers to hit those numbers is 66 receptions, 922 yards, and six touchdowns, which would have been the wide receiver 30 this season. I'm not saying that just because you hit those numbers, you're going to do that the following season. But it's good to know that a wide receiver that does as well as he did at such a young age really has the potential to become you know, a fantasy viable wide receiver three and has the potential to be a wide receiver two going forward. And we look at the draft where they're picking. I believe it's number five or number six. I think the Chargers are six. They have a good five. shot at getting Tua. And if they get Tua, that offense, obviously Ryan Fitzpatrick made that offense look pretty good down the stretch. If they get Tua Tagovailoa throwing to Devontae Parker and to Preston Williams, that only helps his value. Because although Fitzpatrick was decent, his shelf life is not much more than you know eight, eight weeks next season before they move on and try to find something new. So if that quarterback situation improves, you know, the sky's the limit for Preston Williams. As for what I'd be willing to pay for him, mid-second round pick is probably going to get it done for you, and I'm willing to give that up because, you know, he ended the season hurt. People probably forget how dominant he was before he got injured. I believe the last game he played, he actually scored two touchdowns before tearing his ACL. Uh, another one-for-one one I would do. It might be a little bit costly. You know, Mike Williams for Preston Williams. I, I don't spicy. Hate it. It, is, it is a hot take because Mike Williams went from 10 touchdowns to 1,000 receiving yards, but, you know, he's a lot younger. Quarterback situation is probably going to get right earlier in Miami than it is in L.A., and he has a chance to be the wide receiver one, whereas I don't think Mike Williams is ever going to be anything higher than three. I will say this. Uh, it depends what the QB situation is, right? If Tua goes to the Chargers, oh, no. I think that I'm changes it for me. Right? Yeah. And if Tua, But if the Chargers get Justin Herbert, uh, I mean, in case you don't know what Justin Herbert looks like under pressure, just Google – or YouTube a video of a folding chair because that's that's basically what he looks like. So yeah, look if Herbert goes there, Twitter and find like a video of him throwing that girl through a table, and that's what <laughs> just yeah, exactly. Out. If Herbert goes to the Chargers, then no thanks. But it's going to be really interesting to see where the where the quarterbacks play out. Yeah, and one last thing about Preston Williams, the new OC there, Chan Gailey. I put out a tweet a couple weeks ago talking about his red zone usage for receivers uh, since 2008 when he was with Kansas City, and as I brought up before, he actually was outpacing. Devontae Parker in the red zone for for how Chan Gailey uses wide receivers in the red zone in 2008 Dwayne Bowe had the 10th most receiving targets in the end zone among wide receivers with 18 his three years in Buffalo with Stevie Johnson who was by no means a big receiver he was just more of a technician he had 17 19 and 16 targets which ranked 15th 6th and 17th in those years and then with the Jets in 2015 and 2016 he showed he could use more than one receiver in the red zone that came with Eric Decker leading the league with 28 targets in the red zone Brandon Marshall with 21, and then the year, the following year, uh, Eric Decker was no longer in the picture. But that Quincy Inunua and Brandon Marshall. Brandon Marshall had the sixth most red zone targets that year. Inunua was 22nd. So I think, you know, obviously if they get another quarterback and this offense becomes a little more efficient, Chan Gailey has shown enough over his entire career as a head coach or OC that he wants to use a, a, a red zone receiver. And Preston Williams can keep up these touchdown numbers going forward. So you're telling me he's Mike McCarthy? Is that what I'm hearing? Basically, but he's had pretty good rushing offenses too. I mean, he's had like <laughs> Jamal Charles and Larry Johnson and stuff. So he's just a little bit of an older Mike McCarthy. What would you, uh, what would you give on top of Preston to get Devontae Parker? Or put conversely, since you're a buyer, if you had Devontae Parker, what would you get asked for on top of Preston Williams to give up Parker? I'd probably ask for a first just because the value of Parker right now, although I don't think the difference is all too great. I know that the value, the perceived value is enough for me to capitalize on maybe a first round pick on top of it. Yeah, I think you're right because I think Preston Williams probably viewed more than that like toss in. And that's kind of the general theme of this. You see us like touting a lot of these buys and, you know, some of them are probably viewed by most community as like toss ins into a trade. So look for players that you like on other people's rosters that have like these types of toss in players. And that's like a really good value gap. You, know, you can kind of go in and say, look, I really want, player x 
but I think there's a little bit of a value gap. But you know, I kind of also like Preston Williams or Deontay Johnson. If you toss them in as an even, as an evening out item, like that's when I'd make that trade. I think that's a strategy that I use a lot of. Yeah, and these aren't guys that are gonna, as I said before, aren't gonna completely flip the landscape of a trade. People might just ask for a third in return, and you say, okay, of course I'm gonna do that, and then you you get it done. You get another piece. You get more, you know, assets to your team that have the potential to break out. And that's why we're covering these guys because they're in situations that, although they might not have produced early on, they're in situations that are looking like up for the future. They're all young. They're going to be on their teams for a long time, hopefully. And this is dynasty. You want to look maybe one to two years down the line if you're in a rebuild mode. And these are guys that have potential to break out. And we're going to obviously, conversely, let's ruin that sentiment by talking about an older receiver who's not going to stay on the same team. That's right. I cheated a little bit on this one. But I think he's still young, and it's Prashad Perriman. So if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen the buying spree that I've been on, and the reason why I've been pushing that so hard is because I knew I was going to talk about him on one of these episodes. So I wanted to get, uh, get all my trades out there before, uh, before it was too late. But he's a little bit older, but he's still only 26 years old. He's a former first-round pick, 20-year-old breakout, which isn't elite, but that's kind of the, the cutoff that you want to want to go for for wide receivers. He was able to hit a 35% dominator. So obviously that is an elite level and he's an elite athlete. Unfortunately, his closest comp on player profiler is Kevin white. Rest in peace, bro. He didn't die, but he died for fantasy. So um, who knows? He's still got that six year breakout under his belt. <laughs> yeah. Six year breakout. So basically up until this year, Perriman has been a no show for his entire career. And most people have written him off. I wrote him off. But the reason why I started to look at him again is because of how he finished out the year. So he was wide receiver three, uh, not a wide receiver three. He was the wide receiver three. So top three from weeks 13 to 17 and from weeks 15 to 17, which was without Chris Godwin and without Mike Evans, when he was the top dog, he was the wide receiver two overall. So when he was given the opportunity, he showed out and he showed out against the opposing defense's top corners when there were no other weapons around him other than Scotty Miller and big dog favorite Justin Watson. I'm not sure we like those guys. They're they're basically non factors as of right now, right? So watch your mouth. I love Scotty Miller. <laughs> okay, no Scotty Miller slander on this channel. Okay, fine. But he did absolutely show out this year. And what gives me confidence is the fact that he was able to show out without much of a supporting cast, which means that when he's a free agent, which he is this year he has the opportunity to perform elsewhere and kind of take on that wide receiver one role. If it's open kind of like, you know, maybe somewhere in Philly or be a very good complimentary wide receiver to potentially somewhere like, you know, green Bay across from Devonte Adams. We all know that MVS and whatever Geronimo Allison definitely in it. So I think adding him to one of those two offenses would make his value skyrocket, which is why I've been buying before that happens. I think that the risk return curve is very uneven for him because of the cost that I was able to buy him at. So just to give you an example, one trade I got was two, a third and two fourths in a super flex league. I did a 3.01 and a late third in a single QB league. I did a, I also did him as a toss in where I basically gave up Josh Jacobs and a fifth round pick for Paramin plus the 1.03 in a super flex league. So, you know, in that trade, shockingly i was not going after the 1.03 i was going after paraman but i looked i saw an opportunity to kind of swap out jacobs uh who i love for the 1.03 an equivalent running back hopefully in this class but i really wanted to land paraman so i think at these types of costs you're looking at wide receiver to upside so someone like the production of a robert woods maybe a little bit less like jarvis landry that's the upside he can offer you if he lands on a good situation even if he lands on a bad one like the jets I would still take it because there's a lot of targets there uh, that are available. And he's shown that he can be a wide receiver one when, when, uh, when given the opportunity. Yeah. And I think it's really important. Two things that Mike brought up. Number one, that he showed he could be a wide receiver one. Obviously he didn't do it the entire season, but the fact that he was able to go out there and dominate with nobody else really drawing any coverage away from him is super important. And number two, the trades that he was able to pull off two thirds and a fourth, those are three dart throws. They probably, like they probably have more chance of busting then Brashad Perriman in a new situation has of busting. You have to weigh the opportunity cost because we know Perriman has the ceiling to be obviously not the wide receiver three overall in fantasy. It was just a short stretch. But as he said, a wide receiver two, you know, fringe two, three. What are the chances that, you know, the 307 in a rookie draft turns into a fantasy wide receiver two or three? What are the chances that they land in a good situation where 
Bri- uh, Brashad Perriman is probably heavily coveted in the free agent market because there aren't that many fantastic wide receivers uh, hitting the market this season. There's like Robbie Anderson, a bunch of like older guys. So uh, if somebody pays him, they're probably going to pay him to be a two on their offense. If he lands on a team with a bunch of vacated targets, he obviously has the opportunity to capitalize on those. And he showed enough when it comes to draft capital that somebody wanted to take a chance on him early. It obviously didn't work out, but now he has the opportunity to do it once more on a new team in a fresh situation. And I was listening to a podcast. I forgot what it was, but if we remember, I think it was one or two years ago, the end of the season in Cleveland, like he wasn't that bad there either. They just gave up on him because they bring in Odell. So uh, it's not like he's been an awful receiver in fantasy or not in fantasy, but in real life. So I think somebody's willing to give him a chance and he can, you know, have that opportunity to return value much more than a fourth round uh, dynasty rookie pick. How out of these three guys, uh, Preston Williams, Deontay Johnson and Brashad Perriman, how would you, how would you rank them? I think I'd probably go Deontay, Brashad Perriman, and then Preston Williams. Interesting. Interesting. I, so I actually have it, uh, Perriman, DJ, and then Preston Williams. Um, We got Preston third, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not to say he's bad. I'm just saying like, you know, out of these three lower end guys that we think are really affordable, like who would you go after? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that's kind of the way I would do it just because I've seen that upside from him. Yeah. I think it might be me being a little bit more risk averse just because Deontay Johnson is younger and I want somebody who may have a, you know, a safer floor for a longer period of time. But Perriman, if we're talking pure upside, I think it probably goes Perriman, maybe Williams second then Deontay. I think just Deontay's safety makes me put him at number one, but yeah, Perriman's a guy that if you can capitalize on, late picks for him I'm completely buying in if you can replicate a trade that Mike did add him as a throw in or just get him for late you know dart throws go for it yeah I think come draft time he'll probably go up a little bit more and hopefully if people listen to this podcast enough of them and it'll probably influence their decision as well but I'd be willing to pay up to that late second if you're sitting there on the clock in the rookie draft and you're looking at guys like Denzel Mims you know Antonio Antonio Gandy Golden like Brandon Ayuk if he's there I would definitely take the shot on Brashad Perriman over any of those guys. Yeah. And before we get into the narrative this week, we are going to have a little plug season. The Big Dogs Draft Guide, you can type it in in your search bar at bigdogsdraftguide.com. We got three different options. We got the rookie guide. We got the season guide. We got the duo for a decent little a little uh, discount, as they call it in the English language. I couldn't find it. Package deal. It's called a, a package, package deal. A package deal, a little discount, whatever. Um, and as always, every week we're going to be giving away one draft guide. If you tweet us with hashtag bunk bed breakdowns, if you send us a picture of a newborn baby, we might just choose you by default. No, nah, that one's out, man. We, we, we've out. used up the one, the one newborn baby quota. So you got to be original. Yeah, maybe like a dog or something, something that will like, <laughs> catch your attention. But we got a few this week. It's all, you know, warm welcome. We, we enjoy that you guys are enjoying it. We love to help you guys. And we like to see the feedback, even if it's negative. Tell me that I don't, I shouldn't be wearing red bandanas in videos. Tell me I shouldn't be wearing things that make me look like Raphael Nadal. Whatever it is, leave a review, tweet us, hashtag bunk bed breakdowns. We'll be giving away one draft guide. And another thing on top of this, we will be giving away two additional draft guides for when Mike and I both hit 3,000 followers on Twitter. Our 3,000th follower, if they want a draft guide, it's free to give away to them. So if you're not following us right now, Actually, that might incentivize them to wait till we're at twenty nine ninety nine and then follow us. But, you know, follow us now, bump us up to the number, then unfollow us, and then follow us when we get to three thousand. You'll get a draft guide. You guys screenshot us some proof or something. But we'll give away a few more. But we got a bunch of rookie breakdowns in there. We got some dynasty draft strategy. We got some breakouts for you know similar stuff to this. Breakouts for the next season, twenty twenty one prospects. The draft guide's got it all. It's at an affordable price. Some jokes in there. Mike likes to you know throw around a few jokes. Uh, I do as well. Sometimes it gets a little hectic when I'm <laughs> smashing my keyboard. But it's if a I good offend point. you with my jokes, I'm not sorry. Just want to let you guys know that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm trying to be too offensive. I just try to be like wordplay and like things that make me seem like I'm Rain Man without the math skills. So, uh, yeah. So we'll move on from this into the narrative. <laughs> All right, we're kicking it off this week with the narrative. Hope you guys like that sexy intro done by uh, Scott, big dog favorite over here. But this week's narrative is you have to sell running backs after their fourth year or before they hit 25. Noah, what do you think? I, I might just edit in that Dwight Schrute false thing. I'm going <laughs> to yeah, yeah. a few guys that have put up over 200 PPR fantasy points 
at the age of 26 or older. They're obviously elite, but they're elite because they did this. And there's a lot of running backs that are getting older that are still elite right now. We got Tiki Barber, Corey Dillon, Priest Holmes, Edron James, Thomas Jones, Curtis Martin, Walter Payton, Barry Sanders, LT, Water, Ricky Waters, Shady, Stephen Jackson, Fred Jackson, Mark Ingram, Matt Forte, Marshall Falk, Work Done. Basically just telling you that if you think every single running back that has their 25th birthday, their knees just suddenly collapse like Eminem, like it's, it's not going to happen, right? These guys, especially if they're pass catchers like Marshall Falk, like Matt Forte, guys that can, you know, bring you fantasy value through the air that aren't used so heavily between the tackles that obviously extends their fantasy shelf life. Um, some other in-depth stats, right? The PPR running back 20 over the past five years has averaged 183.7 fantasy points. Since the year 2010, a 10-year sample, 84 running backs aged 26 or older have hit that mark. So basically 42% of running backs over that span have been 26 years old or older. 32% of what would be a top 20 running back have been 27 or older and 21% have been 28 or older. So it's not like once you hit this certain age, you obviously fall off a cliff. Once you hit 29 and 30, that's when the numbers start to decrease. Those numbers were 11% and 7%. There's those outliers like, you know, we might see a Christian McCaffrey who's catching 150 passes by the year 2028 uh, be very fantasy relevant. But another thing to look at is these guys that were relevant to their older, into their older seasons, right? The guys that were 26 or older, 29 of those 84 caught 50 plus balls, 22 uh, of the 63, 27 or year old or older running backs caught 50 plus passes and 15 of the 28 or older running back caught 50 plus passes. So guys that are catching passes are a big portion of the people that remain in the top 20. So if we look at a guy like Le'Veon Bell, sure, he's getting a bit older. He'll be 28 next year, but he's somebody that even this year playing with three different quarterbacks, two of them suck and another one sucked for most of the year. He was still a top 20 running back because he was used heavily in the receiving game. He ran behind the second worst offensive line per football outsiders, yet he was still a very like decent fantasy asset. If you remember, he was basically on Nick and my trade target video every single week because we thought that schedule was going to help him produce. It didn't, but he was still a <laughs> decent guy that you throw into your weekly rankings around, you know, running back 10 to 15. And although he is older, he's somebody that is going to gain value through the passing game. So I think he has one to two more years left in the tank. And for what he's being pegged as, I think the running back 19, I'm, I'm not so sure that his perceived value in a trade is even that high. I'm sure you could get him for a late first. Maybe you don't want to do that. But if you're competing now, an early second, late first, I'd probably pull the trigger on that if you want to you know, get a running back who could be easily top 14, 15 guy for the next two or three years. Definitely. Um, so I think I, I, I approach the, sub, the subject like differently, just depending on what your team's position to do, right? So from a production perspective, you definitely have very productive running backs from 25 to like 28 even, right? So if you're a competitive team and you're looking for production, there's no better time to buy running backs than during that period because they're always going to get a discount and, you know, you just ride them in the sunset and get the points, right? But if you're in a rebuild, obviously you're not going to be buying these guys because from a value curve perspective, because the perception is, or I guess no, because the narrative is that you have to sell everyone at the, at this age, you're not going to get the value for them. Right. So I think, I think that's how I approach it. So the narrative is like, you know what, you shouldn't have always sell them, but if you are selling them, then at least make sure you're not a competing team. Cause I think it's more detrimental to take those points off your team than the value that you're getting in return. Cause I think you, you would struggle to get a late first for Le'Veon Bell right now, which sounds kind of crazy, right? Cause the guy is still yeah. a leading workhorse running back in the NFL. Yeah. It was like one or two years ago. This guy was an easy first round dynasty pick. And then he sits out a season and he lands on the jets. And now everybody would rather like own his rap album then pick them up in <laughs> dynasty. It's, it's pretty crazy how things switch so quickly in dynasty. But as you were saying, right, it's a lot easier to talk about selling a player that had, that came off a good season, despite them being older than it is in reality. There's a guy, little known guy by Chris Carson. I just picked up an orphan team and Chris Carson was on my roster and he's somebody who is going to be 26 next season uh, in the early part of next season. And I'm a little bit worried about him, not so much because of the age, but the situation that he's in. Well, first off, he hasn't played a healthy season since his first year at Oklahoma State. I believe it was 2015. 
there's obviously concerns there. He's like broken his ankle. He's broken his hip. He's broken his heart probably over that span. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and on top of that, right, they've shown a lot of commitment to Chris Carson, whether it be, you know, CJ Procise thinking he was an actual running back and then still (laughs) running with him or Rashad Penny. He tore his ACL this year. So he's not going to be back for the beginning of the season, but I mean, who knows? They're in Washington. They probably have that crazy, like, health medical stuff and he's gonna be he's probably running right now he's probably running to my (laughs) dorm right now to beat my ass but uh we look at what this situation is they have one first round pick and they have two second round picks this year we saw Pete Carroll and those guys go for Rashad Penny in the first round and use him as if he was Duke Johnson throughout his career what are the chances that they pick up a running back in the first two rounds this year I would say pretty good especially pretty pretty good pretty I set that up so it sounded like I was gonna say bad but it's it's very good because they show that they want to pick up a running back in the first round, despite having Chris Carson already. Now they have half of Chris Carson. They're probably going to trade up to like a top 10 pick and grab a running back. So the situation around him is probably the reason I'm selling, not so much just his age. And I'm like, how do you feel about Chris Carson right now? I have some of the same concerns. I mean, we don't know what the situation is with his hip. Uh, I think when it first happened, people were quick to jump to the Bo Jackson conclusion. I think we've kind of backtracked away from that now. Yeah, he's a but, much better athlete than Bo Jackson was. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, you know, Chris Carson, he's not a good pass catcher, even though Schottenheimer did his very best to try and force him to catch passes. Mm-hmm. You could just see that it was not natural at all. A lot of the times he's doing a lot of this, like, oh, hit it once and then catch up below type thing. Catches uh, like no offense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm definitely slightly concerned there. And like you, I think that, there's a good chance that they actually draft a running back. And wouldn't it be magical to see Cam Akers land in Seattle? A physical running back with pets with cast with pass catching skills who knows how to run behind a bad O line. That would be a thing of beauty. And if that were to happen, I would, you know, kiss deuces to Chris Carson and Rashad Penny and be all aboard the Cam Akers train as I am right now. Yeah, that's a huge risk, especially if you're a Carson owner, is if you sell him right now, you're probably selling low. But if you sell after the draft and they do take a running back, what are you going to get for him? He has beaten out a first-round talent before in Rashad Penny, but Rashad Penny wasn't really a first-round talent. He was like a fourth-round talent that <laughs> yeah. Carroll really wanted for some reason. So his value is going to go down from there. If they don't invest in a running back in the draft, his value probably won't even go up too much from where it is right now just because of the injury concern. So why not just try to get him out right now before the potential for his value to plummet? And Scott, please don't listen to this because I know I've been sending you some Chris Carson uh, <laughs> trades right now. Anybody in that league, just imagine I made all these numbers and all this stuff up. Chris Carson's a fantastic running back. <laughs> RB1. <laughs> Basically. Uh, next up, a guy who I absolutely love, someone I've been standing for a long time, wrote multiple articles and Twitter threads about him. Champagne Poppy, Canyon Drake. I thought you were say Kelly Oubre. <laughs> no, I, I actually uh, I love Kenyon Drake. And, you know, he is on the older side, but as we know, because he was under the Adam Gase regime, he didn't get many touches because they wanted to march that dumpster out there, a.k.a. Kel, uh, Kellen Balaj, that is his full name. I don't know, whatever. The, the worst running back I've ever seen in my life. And he, so he took a lot of touches there. But when given touches, he was very effective. I, I think he, I quoted this in my article. I can't recall off the top of my head, but I think whenever he got 14 or more touches, he was basically producing as a RB1. I was so, looking at his numbers earlier, and I was looking at 15 or more, and then I saw a bunch of games where he had 14 touches, and I'm like, damn, he did really well on those. So yeah, I didn't go like, through the numbers, but yeah, he was definitely yeah. very good. And we saw this season, finally, he's in a system that leverages him to his assets. Cliff, Kling, Cliff Kingsbury is obviously a you know pretty good offensive mind from what we've seen so far. Obviously, he could always go down that Sean McVay route and get too smart. But for now, I think Drake in this system – Bodes really well. And he just tweeted out a new profile pic of him in an Arizona Cardinals uh, uniform. I don't know if that means he's staying there, but if he is, that's the ideal landing spot. If he isn't, he has shown that he can be a lead dog. And I think I've said this before, but he, he's got one of the most dank dead legs ever. And I just love watching him play. And he's produced. And he helped me win my championship this year. So now I'm never trading him. So if you're trying to trade me for Kenyon Drake, get the fuck out of my trade inbox because I'm not trading him for anything. Yeah, I don't believe a player is going to stay with their team until they tr- like, tweet out that Wolf of Wall Street clip. <laughs> where he's saying, oh, yeah. I'm not leaving. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> but the thing about him, though, is they were paying David Johnson so much money this past year. And when they brought in, like, they didn't have to trade for Kenyon Drake. It's not like they were competing for anything. They were playing in a division with the Rams, the Seahawks, 
and the eventual Super Bowl losers, the 49ers, like they did it because they know David Johnson has nothing left in the tank and they showed no allegiance to DJ when Kenyon Drake got there. It was that Thursday night game. It was a quick turnaround. He absolutely destroyed San Francisco on the ground, who up until that point was a very good run defense. And you look at the teams that Kenyon Drake faced in Arizona this past year, played San Francisco twice, Tampa Bay, Pittsburgh, and the Rams in five of his eight games. Those were all very good run defenses. And his pace when he joined that team uh, actually paced out to 246 carries, uh, 1,286 yards, and 16 rushing touchdowns. On top of that, 70 targets, 56 receptions, 342 yards, and two receiving touchdowns. So as Mike said, every time he's given the opportunity to play and to be a lead back, he has been elite. Obviously, his time in Miami wasn't spent very well because he was sitting behind, you know, guys like Patrick Laird and Kalen Balaj, who are supposed to be good pass catchers, but can't you know, they duck when the ball comes after them, which I don't understand how that happens when you're an NFL player. But, you know, if they bring him back, which I believe that they will, he doesn't – I know this isn't a great reason, but he doesn't seem like a guy who's going to go out there and ask for a huge contract because I think he kind of knows that he hasn't been put on full display yet. And I think that Arizona likes him, and he likes Arizona. As you said, he switched his profile picture. We'll take that at face value. But if he returns to this team, I could see him next season being, you know, a top 12 running back because that's basically all he's ever been when he's been given the opportunity. He is 26 years old, so he is quote-unquote old, but he's never really had a ton of touches, so he doesn't have a lot of wear on his body, whether it be back in Alabama or in Miami. So, if he's given the reins and he signs, you know, three, four year deal, I could see him being a very valuable fantasy asset for the foreseeable future. And, you know, in dynasty, you don't want to look five, six years down the road. So he's somebody that I'm buying in on because I think in the window that you want to compete in, if you're buying right now for a running back, he's going to fulfill your team's needs. Yeah. And he's currently going as the RB 25. So outside of the RB two fringe RB three and with those types of touches, that type of volume, that type of talent, that type of team, you get the big dog stamp of approval. So go out, go out there and buy them, guys. Uh, next up, Melvin Gordon, hometown favorite. Uh, what are you doing with Melvin Gordon? This is weird because his, his positional ADP is running back 13 right now, but I don't think he's really perceived. There's a lot of these guys that I feel like they're not perceived as highly as their ADP would suggest. I yep. feel like if you throw out like a late first-round pick, you could probably maybe get that done. Because Melvin Gordon is going to be 27 next year, and he's been hurt a lot throughout his career, but – not this past season when he sat out the year prior, the injury he had was one of the worst play calls I've ever seen. They were beating the hell out of Arizona Cardinals, like 34 to six at halftime. They ran a reverse. He got a helmet hit to the side of his knee and he limped off and I started to shed tears. That was a <laughs> disgusting play call. So maybe it's a little biased for me to say he's not injury prone, but I'm also not a doctor. So whatever. Um, as for Melvin Gordon, this year, he wasn't extremely efficient. That had a lot to do with Philip Rivers being extremely inefficient. The year prior, he looked like a completely different back than he was early in his career. And I don't see any reason for him to not be that guy. Obviously, he wants to get a lot of money. And there was talks of the Chargers giving him $40 million in the beginning of the year, and he turned it down. I think at this point, he's just going to take whatever somebody's willing to give him. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes back to L.A. I'd probably expect more of a 50-50 split between he and Eckler, but he's still the goal line back. He's still heavily involved in the offense. I think wherever he goes, he's probably still going to be you know, a borderline running back one at the age of 27, you know, one to two more years in the tank as a guy who can, you know, give you value through the air. So he's not somebody I'm necessarily buying, but if somebody's trying to ship him off as, you know, they're a team that isn't contending this year and they want to get some ROI on him, send a, you know, late first round pick to see if that gets it done. Because I think he's somebody that will be valuable for a fantasy team for the next, you know, one to two seasons. Where would you rank him in terms of the incoming rookies? So Let's just go down the list here. Would you rather have Melvin Gordon or Jonathan Taylor? Probably Taylor. It all depends really for me, the draft capital and where they land, but I'll assume, you know. Assuming Taylor gets like, you know, round two draft capital. Yeah, I'd probably go Taylor there. What about Melvin Gordon or Cam Akers? That's huge because I don't, both of us don't think that Cam Akers can be chosen really highly. So I'd probably say Melvin Gordon right now just because we don't know what's going to happen. I got Cam Akers. Okay, so what about Melvin Gordon or Clyde Edwards-Alaire? If he goes round, you know, two or three, I think probably CEH. And I would say with Cam Akers, if he goes round two or three also, I'd probably go Cam Akers. It's just the fact that people think he might go later makes me a little bit more hesitant. What about Melvin Gordon or Zach Moss? Melvin Gordon. Okay, that's kind of where I have it too. So if if you're kind of trying to gauge rookie picks – 
that's kind of how I would go about thinking about it. And if you're looking at that range, you're looking probably at like the 1.08 to 1. Uh, 1.10 range. So if you can, if you're a competing team and you need a running back, again, these guys, workhorses don't fall off trees and productive players aren't falling off trees. So if you want to take a shot and go for the win and hit that W, you definitely uh, could take a chance on Melvin Gordon and do a lot worse. Yeah, and the last guy who isn't really a workhorse running back, but I feel like he's being pretty disrespected uh, per his ADP, the running back 27, is Philip Lindsay. He's a guy who's put up two straight 1,000-yard running seasons. And again, similar to everybody else, I'm not so sure he's being valued as high as his ADP would suggest. He's in an, like a decent up-and-coming offense running behind what was the 10th highest-graded offensive line this year. They have a decent young offensive line. Uh, Drew Locke is obviously going to get a little bit better, hopefully. And he used his running backs pretty heavily out of the backfield. He had this – it would have been the seventh highest uh, target rate to the running back position. He targeted them 25% of the time. And although Philip Lindsay isn't a fantastic pass catcher, he's not a weapon out of the backfield. He's put up 48 and 49 targets out of the backfield these past two seasons. I could see him catching, you know, 35, 40 balls as he's done in the past and just maintain that role as the lead guy and somebody who, you know, despite his frame, you'd think that he's not a goal line back. At least as a rookie, I'm not so sure about this past season, but as a rookie, he took that job from what we thought Royce Freeman was going to have and be that goal line guy there. So he's not somebody I think is ever going to be like a locked and loaded running back one that you can trust week after week. But as the RB27, that suggests you could probably get him for, you know, an early to mid second round pick, maybe throw something else on top. And I'm going to take that because, you know, he's 25 years old. I think he's going to be 26 to start the season, but he doesn't have a lot of wear and tear on his body in terms of NFL production. I know at Colorado or Colorado, he was a very heavily used running back, but uh, we haven't seen him be like super injury prone. He had a wrist injury, but so did 230 pound uh, David Johnson. So I don't think that he's somebody you can just write off as, you know, a small back that only had one off year. I mean, he's put up a thousand yards these past two seasons. And if he's being valued that low, I'm going to buy in on him. Yeah, I'm I'm more of like a hold on Phil Lindsay. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be actively pursuing him just because, like, as a rule of thumb, I just don't really go after running backs and committees on bad offenses. And I know Denver is probably on the up and coming, but until they're actually on the up, I'm probably just going to fade that backfield altogether. If I'm getting committee, I'm looking at high-powered offenses, and if I'm not getting committee, then I'm looking for – people that have the majority of the volume. And I know a lot of people that actually have Royce Freeman as a buy as well. I'm also not there. Uh, he hasn't really shown too much to me that he's better than Philip Lindsay. But again, it could be like a situation where you're kind of revamping the team, revamping the offense, and maybe they, they take another look because Freeman has a capital. But uh, personally, I'm just going to stay away from, from that backfield altogether. I won't knock you for that. I won't knock you for that. He's basically just like what we thought Ronald Jones was going to be. <laughs> a lot of people are hyped yeah. up about Ronald Jones, and I would just much rather have Philip Lindsay. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely take Philip Lindsay over Ronald Jones. All right, and I think that does it for the narrative, and I think that does it for I believe it's week four of bunk bed breakdowns. Hope you guys enjoyed. Check us out on Twitter; it'll be linked at the end of the video, and it's been below our names this entire time. Check out Mike. Check out me if you want. Uh, you know, send us a review. You have a chance to win a draft guide for next week. We'll announce it at the top of the show. If you do win, and if the guy that won this week stayed around, DM one of us. We will get you set up with the draft guide. But I think that's it for now. Hope you guys have a great day. Peace out, big dogs. talk for a second yo yo all right you have the right mic <laughs> Dude, there's some controversy about my headband oh, <laughs> gang are you in like man fuck you <laughs> <laughs> all right you ready <laughs> uh yeah i'm ready kick it off